Okay, good. Yes, uh, but uh, welcome everyone, and nice to to see you there, and nice to see you again, Adrian. Um, I I saw I I actually met you in 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 person, which it seems like a, a million years ago, but it actually wasn't that long ago. It was uh, at oh, the yeah. IDEC conference in in Seoul in 2019, and it was in uh, I think it was December. If I, if yeah, I that was a great. It was just great before moment. the world changed completely. Just like, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's super weird. Like after, just like a few months after that conference, uh, basically, my own country locked down and yours as well. So, uh, yeah, so it's just uh, felt so surreal. Like thinking back on going in the streets of Seoul uh, without no masks oh, yeah. and all the people there. And yeah, but uh, it's nice to see you again. And I'm really <laughs> excited to to have you here and uh, just to give a like a very short introduction to Adrian. He's a PhD student at the let me see if I can get like it's the French National Institute for Health and Medical Research. Yes, uh, correct. In in SAM, that's uh, that's the acronym I, that I, I know of. And uh, you are a PhD student there. I can. Uh, how far are you in your PhD studies? Uh, in my last year now. In last year, so, yes, yeah. Yeah. Good, but uh, yeah, go ahead and uh, we look forward to hear a little bit about uh, using artificial intelligence methods and social media data to investigate more like <laughs> this th theme of uh, diabetes distress, which is actually an important topic in, in diabetes research because it, it it's, um, it, yeah, people who live with diabetes, they I th I'm sure they recognize this and it's it's really important, so yeah. Okay, uh, thanks for uh, for your kind words um, and thanks for the invitation. I'm I'm happy to be here to to share um, a bit what I'm doing with you. Um, so uh, just to complete, um, I, I'm working at Inserm and also at the University Paris Saclay and Epiconcept, a company dedicated to public health. So it's a, a big collaboration. Um, in this presentation, so I have a mathematics and computer science background. So probably you, most of you know way more about your diabetes than, than I do. Um, but I, I left out mode of, most of the mathematical concepts uh, or the deep math. Um, but if some of you are interested, uh, I would be happy to take questions um, in the end because yeah, it's quite interesting <laughs> in my opinion. And um, yeah, so I'm talking uh, about uh, the World Diabetes Distress Study today and um, how we use social media and in particular uh, Twitter to identify diabetes uh, distress patterns and how we use um, artificial intelligence to do so. But first, some background for those of you who, who don't know what is, what is uh, diabetes distress. So diabetes distress regroups all psychological factors related to the day-to-day -day disease management. So such as emotional burden, stress, fatigue, anxiety, emotions in general. And up to 36% of adults with diabetes have already been confronted with diabetes distress. So it's uh, considered an independent risk factor for diabetes uh, complications. And so usually in clinical studies, uh, we measure diabetes distress with scales like uh, PAID, so problem areas in diabetes or diabetes distress scales. Those are the two most famous ones. And on the left side, um, there is an example of uh, this page. Um, but I mean, it's not for you to, to read it in detail. It's just to give you an idea about the structure and the form. And those scales are today the gold standard. They're validated and uh, largely used. But still, there are several limitations. Uh, they're self-reported, they're non-evolutive, there are components missing, especially work-related um, or cost of treatment um, issues. Then there's the, what we call make my doctor happy effect. That is when a patient tends to say what the doctor wants to hear. And um, so that this gives an additional bias. And that's why we tried to, uh, to, to change a bit the paradigm and investigate the new sources of inf information um, and in our case, uh, or in this case, social media data. And that's the, the objective of the press and the presentation. So how we do that. Just to give you a bit more context um, about the World Diabetes Distress Study. <clears throat> so that's a large initiative that tries to combine um, digital data. So data from social media, smartphone application, connected objects, um, combined with clinical data. Uh, and the aim is then to better understand uh, the burden of diabetes and diabetes distress um, 
using this real world data. And so the presentation I give now that is a sub objective of this global objective and that specifically addresses yeah, social media data and Twitter. So why, why did we come up with Twitter um, at the beginning? Um, Twitter data is very interesting data that is not available in a traditional setting. So the, probably the biggest advantage is that it's data that is shared spontaneously, um, so, uh, which makes it particularly interesting for studying psychological factors. So a bit maybe as intuition behind there, when a person is stressed uh, or angry about something, I mean, he won't go directly see a doctor and tells him, hey, I'm stressed about that. So he rather goes to social media because it's easier and he just tweets about it. And um, so people really tweet all kinds of things, also images, um, so which is very nice. And just as the first thing, what we did to, to really see if, uh, if it's exploitable, if there's really information we can use in it, we just, we, we made a simple word cloud to see what are so the most frequent words occurring. And indeed, at the beginning, we were surprised, but I mean, all interesting concepts uh, we wanted to exploit uh, were found on so nutrition related things, uh, family, drugs, innovations, uh, people talking about uh, glycemia, hypos, um, emotions in general, which confirmed us that, yes, that is a source uh, worth exploiting. <laughs> and um, a bit more points, maybe why Twitter data. So a big advantage for researchers is that the data is public by default. That means we can uh, easily access it. So uh, for those of you who don't know Twitter, but normally when, when you create an, a Twitter account, uh, by default, your profile is public, but you have the chance uh, to switch it in, in private protected mode. But in reality, only a very, very small percentage of people have done that. Uh, then it's a, it's a proven source of information. Uh, so in many, many areas so with many publications already. And we are in the lucky uh, situation that uh, the diabetes community is quite active and strong. So there are, for instance, people, there are, there are several hashtags around, um, or around which people, they gather and they exchange weekly in weekly meetings about their disease, what they can do and support each other. And um, so that's why uh, we started to extract um, diabetes related tweets in May 2017. So the way that works is you, you just you define a list of keywords, so diabetes, insulin, hypoglycemia, and then you just you filter them out. And uh, so today uh, we started with tweets in English, French and Spanish language. So we have around 30 million now. But uh, last year we extended the this by quite some, some other languages, such as also Ch Japanese, Chinese, uh, and many other languages. So normally we, we, sh we should have way more tweets now, but uh, I don't know the exact uh, number. And um, after, geolocation, uh, after we did the geolocation of the tweets, um, so you see on this map where tweets are coming from, and you really, you see we have a nice representation from tweets coming from all over the world with uh, a majority of the tweets coming from the United States, probably due to historical reasons, because Twitter has been invented there. Um, and that's why uh, in the study, we focus um, only on tweets coming from the United States in, in English language. Um, so how did we do that? Um, when we worked with, with textual data, that's um, complicated because it's very noisy. Tweets are very short, uh, they're unstructured, there are many misspelled words. So I think maybe especially a, a big issue on Twitter because people really, they, they don't care so much about grammatical correctness, let's say like that. Um, and that's why um, it's, it's really a, a key point in, in working with text data is the, the pre-processing part. So you, you get clean data to, to work with. And here is an overview about our steps. In the following slides, I go into each of those steps uh, in more detail. But just to give you um, a quick overview. So the first thing we did is um, we re removed all retweets and duplicates to only obtain uh, unique tweets. Then as we are interested in studying tweets with personal content, so really what people share, we train the machine learning classifier to only filter yeah, tweets with personal content. That means we excluded all tweets coming from companies, uh, tweets talking about marketing, health studies, and yeah, uh, not important things. 
Um, and then we actually we started our analysis, but we realized that there are still so many chokes in, in, in the tweets that we needed to, to train a specific choke classifier to specifically filter out chokes. Um, and after, after this, uh, we needed to geolocate tweets to be able to only focus on tweets coming from the United States. And the last step consisted in filtering only tweets um, containing an emotional element as we are interested in studying psychological factors, stress, anxiety, fears, emotion in general. And an emotional element in a tweet is either um, an emoji, an emoticon, or an emotional word. And emotional words, um, so for this we used the, the definition of the psycholog Parrot, who defined um, the six primary emotions, the three positive ones, joy, love, surprise, and the negative ones, uh, sadness, anger, and fear. And each of those um, primary emotions has sub emotions, uh, a, a huge list of yeah, sub emotions, which gives you in the end a, a, a large list of emotions. And so each of those tweets needed to have one, either one of those emotional words or an emoji emoticon. And then for our analysis, um, because we work with text data, so a priori we don't have uh, information about the uh, gender or type of diabetes, so we needed to predict them, which is working quite well today. And um, then we could identify topics of interest. That is really the, the, the central part we wanted to do, to see what are people talking about, so basically to form clusters. And once we obtained those clusters, those topics, what people talk about, we could associate them with socioeconomic factors, such as um, the mean household income. So um, to give you just a, a quick uh, method methodological uh, uh, parenthesis. Um, so how did we do that? We used natural language processing methods, more precisely word embeddings. And so the idea is that each word is transformed into a vector representation. And the intuition behind that is that um, words that talk about the same thing that are semantically similar, their, their vectors are also close in the vector space. And you can imagine that um, when you look on this image on the right side, so each point corresponds to a word. And so the words that talk about the same thing, they're, they're close in this word vector space. So that's why you have in the, uh, in the center, you have uh, all words regrouped, uh, relating to, to feelings, more up uh, words uh, related to travel, food, body part. And um, you don't need to understand that in detail, but uh, the important point maybe to, to keep in mind for that, when you, uh, in modern or machine learning text analysis, more or less, basically everything works or is based on this concept today that you, you work with those uh, word embeddings. So a word is transformed into a vector representation and the words that are close semantically, their vectors are also close. And then we used, um, uh, maybe exactly a, a small parenthesis to that too, is um, those algorithms who transform those words into vectors, they're also able to, um, to handle misspelled words. So for instance, when you have um, the word house, and house with two S, so obviously misspelled, then these algorithms, they're able to, to link those two words and be able to relate them. Something that is uh, important, especially on Twitter, because we have lots of those misspelled uh, words. And then we used um, support vector machines as um, supervised algorithms and uh, K means a simple clustering algorithm to cluster. Mm. So, just to give you, um, for those of you maybe who are not so familiar with um, machine learning, just a, a very quick overview how that is working. Let's say here we want to train a, a classifier that detects tweets with personal content. So then, then we want to train an algorithm that is able to, to make the difference between tweets with personal content and non-personal content. And um, the way that works is we take from all our tweets, we take a random subsample of 1,000 or 2,000 tweets depending on the complexity. And then we read each of those tweets and we label them and say, hey, yes, this is a tweet with personal content. This is a tweet with non-personal content. So just yes, no, yes, no. Um, these tweets are then uh, vectorized, uh, put in a vector um, form. So which gives us this matrix of 200 uh, dimensions, for instance. So if a tweet is transformed in a vector of 2000 dimensions, 
And this matrix is given to uh, the classifier together with the labels. And the machine learning algorithm is not doing nothing else than just finding a, a line or a, or a hyperplane that just separates the points. And each point is a tweet. A, a tweet. And so, yeah, in a more abstract way, maybe mach uh, so machine learning classifiers do nothing else than just separating points, finding lines that separates those points. And once we have this, this line making the difference between personal and non-personal tweets, we can apply all tweets on that and just uh, filter easily um, all the personal tweets. And in the same way, um, the jokes classifier is working. Then for the, the geolocation, um, we used uh, the tweet, uh, a tweets metadata. So when you download um, tweets from Twitter, they come with a lot of metadata um, that, that are attached to, to these tweets. And in this metadata, there uh, specifically, there are three elements that, that can be used uh, or exploited to, um, to geolocate a tweet. Um, the first and the most precise one is the Twitter user location. So, uh, a, so a person can uh, activate the geolocation of a tweet. That means when a person tweets something, Twitter exactly uh, precisely knows the location from where the tweet is sent. Um, but in reality, only very few people have enabled this geolocation. So when that is not available, we use uh, a user's lo uh, location. So um, when in your, Twitter pro in your Twitter profile, you can give the location where you're living uh, or where you're working or something. So we take this and if the user location is not available, we can try to extract um, the location from the user description. So that is that can be anything, but often it's a statement like, uh, hey, I'm a, I'm a teacher and I live in London, I love it, for instance. And the way we, how we extract um, those, um, those places, um, those locations, is we, we use a, a dictionary with all places worldwide from twonames.org. And then we use uh, Spark and Apache Lucene, so a search engine that maps basically the text on the dictionary and finds out the, the location. But uh, there, are, there are some subtleties uh, to, to consider because um, especially in the United States, there exist some cities called Fair Play or Smile. So when a user has in his user description, I like Fair Play, then we don't want to geolocate the tweet at Fair Play. So, because it's clearly not talking about a city. And that's why <clears throat> we trained another classifier that is just giving a probability to each word if that word is a location or not location. And that improves the performance uh, significantly. So, um, and then just a quick overview over the algorithms. So, as I mentioned before, um, we trained algorithms for detecting personal content, uh, jokes, gender type, uh, type of diabetes, and geolocation. And the principle is always the same. We label tweets and then train the algorithm. And we achieved quite, uh, quite good performances. For instance, to detect uh, personal content in a tweet, we obtained a precision of uh, 91%, um, which is quite uh, satisfying. Um, and now to the, um, to the heart, more or less, to identify uh, the topics of interest, to see what are people talking about. Um, here we actually we did two things. Uh, the first thing is a, a quick uh, sentiment analysis, which basically just um, gives a, a score between minus one and one if the tweet is rather negative or rather positive. And for that, we used the valence of our dictionary for sentiment reasoning, which is specifically designed for, for social media data taking also in consideration the emojis, emoticons, and um, the not, yeah, improper language, let's say it like that. And um, for the topic detection, then we used the a K-means, a simple clustering algorithm. And for those of you who have already used clustering algorithms, you know the problem of um, you need to specify the number of topics or classes or clusters beforehand most of the time and usually what you do is you you test it for different uh, number of uh, clusters and for each of those you calculate the score in our case a silhouette score and um, you check where the, you, the score is the highest um, and this is your the number of topics which separates your tweets your data in in the clusters the best 
And in our case, we had um, we had the highest score for 30 clusters. That's why we uh, cluster all our tweets in 30 clusters. Um, and uh, concerning the association between those clusters with the mean household income, what we did is we used um, the mean household income per US city. So this data we got from the American Community Survey. And what we did is we um, grouped the household income into three groups, low income, medium income, and high income. And because we have each tweet geolocated, so we know where the tweet is coming from, then we can simply uh, calculate uh, the distribution. So distribution of a tweet being in a specific topic uh, and coming from a, a low income uh, city or a medium or high income city. So, and now concerning the results. Um, so on this map, you see uh, just a, a quick overview where the geolocated tweets are coming from. And so you see that in California, Texas, people are quite active, or also New York, people tweet a lot. Um, and here you see now um, how we represent our, this, um, our topics of interest, so the clusters. Here you see the most positive topics. So each line corresponds to one topic. So when let's take, for instance, topic number two, inspiring relatives living with diabetes. So this topic label was given by us uh, researchers. Then we have information about the topic size, how many tweets, the sentiment analysis score. So here it's uh, all the groups are ordered by this sentiment analysis score, where one is the, the most positive one, followed by the, the distribution of the score. And then the last column, we have um, the distribution over the, the emotions. So for instance, you see that we have higher percentages of joy and love elements in, in the more positive uh, topics. And uh, an example for, for one of those um, tweets in Inspiring Relatives Living with Diabetes group is, what a talented family, you were, <clears throat> you were amazing yesterday. Thank you for being a great example for living beyond type one uh, diabetes diagnosis. Or other more positive uh, topics are um, topic number three, when people share hope and encourage each other. Or um, topic number 10, um, when they advocate for affordable insulin. Um, here we have further information. Uh, uh, here you see additionally information for the top words, so the most uh, often occurring words in each of those um, topics, followed by um, distributions of our male, female, and unknown, because sometimes we cannot predict if it's coming from a man or a woman, followed by the type one, type two, and also unknown um, diabetes column, and a small description in the end. And in general, uh, we observed um, a slight over-representation of tweets coming from uh, women, uh, especially groups where uh, we could observe um, many women are concerned about this, for instance, Topic number 10, advocacy for affordable insulin, where 70% of the tweets coming from female and only 18%. And similarly, uh, we observed in general uh, overrepresentation of tweets related to type 1 compared to type 2 diabetes. So also a good example is topic number 10 for this year. Um, yes. And then here we have then the most negative topics. Um, Let's take 29, for instance, diabetic insulin shock. And here you see in the last column, we have high occurrences of uh, anger and uh, fear elements from the emotions. Or a big issue is topic number 25, frustration with insulin prices. In general, in insulin prices and access to insulin, access to, to, to medical supplies is a huge topic in the United States. So there are uh, quite some uh, topics relating to, to to the issue of insulin prices. And so one example for topic number 25 might be, um, my insulin is $1,800, it's utterly ridiculous, I can't afford mine either, and sometimes I have to go to an urgent care or ER for insulin. Um, or other negative topics is when people talk about the oral glucose tolerance test or in general diabetes related comorbidities, glycemic instability, Etc. Um, here we have again gender and type of diabetes information. Um, uh, interesting part was that we have our 
one of the few uh, topics male dominated was when they talked about diabetic in and insulin shocks um, and other topics females dominated a lot again was um, when they talked about the oral glucose tolerance test for instance um, topic 26 yeah um, so concerning the associations between the mean household income and uh, those groups so each of those plots um, refers to one of those 30 topics we identified and so we found uh, positive associations um, those are the green ones that means cities with higher incomes are more likely to tweet about those topics. So cities with higher incomes are more likely to talk about advocacy for affordable insulin, for instance, glycemic uh, instability, uh, the frustration with insulin prices, for instance. And uh, cities with lower incomes are more likely uh, to talk about uh, the oral glucose tolerance test, day-to-day uh, -day stories about diabetes, or um, when they, in general, when they enjoy uh, the online support that they have in those online diabetes groups. Um, yeah, so those are the results. What to do with that? Um, so the strength in, in the study was um, certainly the large number of, of people we analyzed and the, the variability in their profiles. And pro yeah, and probably the other big advantage is the, that the data is expressed spontaneously. So we don't have uh, the make my doctor happy effect. We don't have a hierarchy between the patient and uh, the doctor. Um, then the methodology is innovative, uh, which can be applied to, to many other fields. Um, and an interesting point was that uh, lots of topics are less medical oriented, which gives us the possibility to, uh, to identify alternative topics of, of interest, of concern. Um, the biggest limitation is certainly uh, that people with diabetes who are active on social media are not representative of all people with diabetes. Um, but still we, we cover a great variability in their profiles. Um, and we have to interpret those results in the Twitter context. So as I said before, for instance, we have observed uh, quite some or quite more tweets coming from, from people who are, are related to type one diabetes and not type two diabetes. So which is the contrary in the real world. And possible explanations for that might be that um, in general, the people who are, who are active on social media are younger. Um, or we could uh, now post some, some hypotheses. Maybe the, the management of type 1 diabetes is more complicated, more fr frustrating, or people have the need to, to exchange more about it. Um, then another limitation is that uh, the performance of the classifiers is not 100%, clearly. So we have a bias there. And uh, until now, we, we correlated that with very few clinical and environmental variables, but that's also going to change. Um, so to sum it up, um, we can say that social media is a useful source uh, to capture information about people with diabetes feelings, emotions, beliefs, and fears related to diabetes, uh, its treatment and complications. So it's a useful complementary approach to traditional diabetes epidemiology. So we're not saying we should replace traditional diabetes epidemiology, but it's, it's a useful complementary approach. And so for instance, we have shown that people with diabetes in the USA are afraid <clears throat> of the consequences of the increase of insulin costs, frequently share their emotions and fears about diabetes and complications. And uh, for instance, are annoyed by the general confusion between type one and type two diabetes. And those are only three examples that are not included in those gold standard scales um, I showed you at the beginning. Um, so we can conclude, conclude that feelings, emotions, and stress are until today not well taken into account in diabetes epidemiology, and that future clinical um, and epidemiological studies should take these factors into account. Also, intervention studies should focus on reducing the level of stress and fear in people with diabetes. And mm, sorry. And concerning our project, um, the next steps are um, so currently I'm working on extracting causality in, in text um, to identify um, possible new risk factors, especially related, for instance, to, to hypoglycemia. Um, then we ex want to extend those results on other languages, on other um, countries to be able to compare what our concerns in Denmark, for instance, compared to, to the US. 
And there's actually, there's another PhD student of my supervisor, Kifa Grazi, working on that. Um, then we want to correlate um, this information with more socioeconomic and en environmental factors, such as also pollution. Um, and uh, the, the mid and long term goal is to, to create a worldwide online health observatory so we can in real time uh, observe uh, diseases, how they develop, um, extended, not on, uh, extended from diabetes to other diseases, but also other sources of information. I mean, this was limited to, to Twitter, but for instance, a very interesting source is um, Reddit, because in Reddit people, they write more. So the text uh, people share is longer, so it contains more content, context and so more interesting to, uh, to exploit. Uh, and on this study, we published an article, which is linked in, in the next slide. And the whole project is open source. So if you're interested, you can share it, uh, use it, ask us questions would be happy to answer something. And those are all the people um, involved or were involved in the project. A big thanks to them. And yeah, that's it. So I would be happy to, to answer questions. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Adrian. That was uh, yeah, super interesting on, I for me, at least many levels, right? Um, there's uh, yeah, a lot of, like interesting methods and like also and also what you you find with using this data um yeah so i don't know if anyone have any like burning questions otherwise i can i can i can start us out here <laughs> and i think one of the things i've thought about was yeah if you can just kind of elaborate maybe a little bit more like what so what are, like i can clearly see that there's a lot of work going into like pre-processing this data but would you also say that that was actually one of the biggest challenges here with the with a like a project like this or what did you mm, find was, was yes. really challenging in, yeah. in this yes i mean i mean it's a very iterative process um so so you do a little bit of pre-processing in the beginning and then when you start your analysis you realize oh no there's too much too much noise so you need to continue and continue and continue that's why we needed to add for instance this choke classifier in the end and we didn't plan at the beginning to add those um, this um, emotional tweet filter, if you want. So we just we tried and also always may also reduce the the interesting tweets we wanted to study. But uh, it's yeah, it's it's a very iterative process. So at the beginning, it's it's difficult to 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 plan that. Yeah, I, I wonder if you could go back to the um, to the flow ah, chart yeah. with the pre-processing because I was just sure, actually sure. really. I don't know if I was surprised. I don't know what I expected, but if, yeah, exactly that one. Because if we see, like, we start with like 11.7 million tweets and they're just oh, yeah. removing duplicates and retweets, that's then you have like removed 8.4 million tweets. It seems like there's oh, yeah, a lot that's... of redundant information on Twitter just, uh, <laughs> just looking at, at those figures. I was surprised by that. And yeah, and, and actually, yes, how many. Yes. I, how actually compared to how many tweets that there were you identified right how few actually contain some like relevant information. Impo relevant information of course you have a specific question in mind but like when you sort out all the, the all the things it's like yeah it's yeah. still a lot but, but it's um like you no, start it's, still, it's it's still a lot but mm -hmm. i i have to say here we were really strict so there are many um, publications out there who, who are not that strict um in, in the pre-processing part. I mean, some they, they just, uh, they filter out uh, duplicates and retweets and that's it. And then they, they start analyzing. But it, it depends on, on your use case, what you want to do. But uh, it's true, it's, it's quite a lot, it's quite a lot. Especially retweets. So from those retweets and duplicates, there's only a minority of duplicates. The majority is really retweets. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. In interesting in, in itself. and. Uh, and I have to ask about that joke classifier as well. Mm -hmm. So did you just find any interesting jokes also? Like, uh, could you look at that or? <laughs> oh, yeah, just, uh, in, it, in general, stuff? It's, yeah, no, it, in, in general, guess. in general, it's very, it's very funny and amusing to work with Twitter data because you, it's, it's just crazy what people share, honestly, <laughs> it's very funny. No, but concerning the, the jokes, um, basically you can group that in, in 
two categories. So one part of the jokes relating to nutrition. So a person saying, hey, I ate five bars of chocolate and tomorrow I will have diabetes. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and the other tweet is, or the other direction is uh, more uh, sexist tweets like, hey, you look so sweet. Uh, uh, tomorrow I will get uh, diabetes when I see you. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. So basically it's those two, uh, but there are quite a lot. There are really quite a lot. So probably more is related to nutrition, nutrition related jokes. But yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe also, I, I don't know that that is a hypothesis, but maybe it's even more in the United States uh, because uh, I mean, they, they, the food is very sugary over there co compared to here. So maybe you would observe even more tweets there uh, related to yeah nutrition jokes compared to here. Yeah, yeah and just on the, when I go forward to like your final points, right? To extend this and having this like global observatory of like health, um, different health concepts or like with digital data. I'm just also thinking like, for instance, with it in a Danish context, right? Then we have the registers. So suddenly mm -hmm. you have something maybe really interesting to, to, to couple up with, uh, with, with them. Yeah, especially on social context. media. I mean, yeah. You see very fast, for instance, when uh, um, the Freestyle Leap was introduced in um, uh, 2017 or something, you really you saw immediately so many people talking about it. There was really a, a peak in the tweets talking about that. And it's for this social media is quite interesting because you you see trends, you can really observe trends coming up, people talking about it, you have an immediate feedback, um, uh, which makes it very, very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any any other questions from from any other people? Just uh, yeah. Yeah. So this is Camille. Hello, Adrian. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. I really learned Thanks. a lot. Yeah. So I just had one comment and I think one question. <clears throat> so the comment maybe was to supplement the the discussion that you made about uh, most of the participants having type one diabetes. So what came to my mind uh, looking at the result was really about insulin. I mean, age may contribute, but I really thought about insulin because this year is actually 100 years since the discovery of insulin. And so there are so many papers that have been published around the challenges uh, around access and affordability to insulin, even 100 years after the discovery. And knowing that insulin is actually life-saving for patients with type 1 diabetes, like they have no other option. It's not like type 2 diabetes where you have over 10 classes of medications, which are getting more and more affordable because of competition and production every day. I mean, type 1 diabetes and insulin is really, really something. So I guess, I mean, my assumption would be, apart from the age, like lots of people switching around this life-saving medication, which they don't still have yeah. access to. To to totally, totally. And maybe just uh, to, to add up on that, um, or sorry, if you wanted to add something. No, 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 that's fine. Go ahead, please. Uh, okay. Um, in the publication we, we wrote, uh, we observed that 19% of all tweets are related to, uh, to insulin prices in one way or the other. So really, that is, yeah. it's a crazy topic. And there are also many tweets, um, like you're saying, uh, talking about, yeah, 100 years ago, it was so cheap. It cost $1. The inventor wanted it so cheap. And now what you look, what the, the big pharmaceutical companies did. Um, so many people are very, very um, disappointed, very angry about the yeah. situation. And it's, it's, it's awful. Seriously, there's, there's one group, for instance, um, related to glucose guardians. So uh, before, a couple of years ago, it was called sugar daddy. So people are looking for a person uh, to pay for their insulin uh, yeah. in, in exchange for some favor. <laughs> And so there's, it's, it's awful really to, to see that. Yeah. Yes. So we are in a happy situation here in Europe. Yeah. So, thank you very much again for bringing that out. So, and then maybe the question was really about the topic in general. So it's about distress, but then I wonder if I was, if I had like severe distress or getting to depression, would I have the, would I have the energy or even the willingness to ever tweet something? So would you think that this is just a category of people, certainly with mild depression that has been captured in this study? Or do you really think that you can get people with severe distress or even depression who still get to tweet about their, their states? 
That's a very good question, uh, a very complicated question. So of course here I could just guess. Um, but for me, the main point here is the, the very easy access uh, to, to Twitter, to exchange. And I think a person with really severe distress feels really depressed. Um, I mean, I think it's easier for the person to just tweet and share this online then maybe make an appointment with a doctor and, and go and, and, sh and share it with him so i i cannot tell you exactly if a, a person with severe diabetes would never go on twitter I, because there are people who really say that they are very very depressed um but of course i cannot measure the really the level of, of, of depression but i think uh, still all kinds of depressions are out there on Twitter, just because it's very, very easy to to share something, and you easily you find um, people in, in similar situations. So really, there are so many groups. So, for instance, the DSMA, the Diabetes Social Media Advocacy Group. Then, for each country, you have the GB Doc, uh, Great Britain Diabetes Online Community uh, Group. So you have quite some groups where people really can come with their problems and discuss about everything, and. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yes, because really what made me think about that again was looking at your result. I think you shared about people from higher socioeconomic status, so maybe represented by high income, actually treating more, I think, than people from, mm -hmm. from, from the lower socioeconomic status. And I mean, that made me think that it could, it could yeah, negative association, positive association, yeah likely to treat more. So that actually made me to think that is it, could it be because people from lower socioeconomic status are more likely to have challenges in accessing medications, for example, or have more complications. And so I, I, I could be more likely to, to, uh, to face the yes. severe diabetes depressed or depression. And so these people are really not captured compared to, compared to people from high, socioeconomic stage and that's why you could be seeing this this these differences that you're seeing in your data yeah I mean, that was just something yeah that came to i mean that that were yeah we, we actually we, we had similar thoughts um for instance when you take here topic 10 advocacy for affordable insulin so cities with higher income are more likely to to tweet about this topic and um, probably it's just because uh, people from from richer cities for them, it's easier to, to gather around such, uh, such groups um, to advocate together. Whereas, um, as you say, uh, topic number five is typically that DSMA, so Diabetes Social Media Advocacy, enjoying online support. So people there really meet online and they just exchange. And uh, maybe, yeah, it's, they, they're kind of excluded or it's more complicated for them to make the step to go to the doctor. Uh, and it's just easier to go online and exchange with people with people online, but that is um, that are hypotheses. It would be super interesting to 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 check that in uh, in a real cohort study. That's why those kind of studies are interesting because um, I mean those are data driven approaches. So we don't have any uh, hypothesis assumption beforehand about those data. And we just we create our hypothesis, if you want. So this hypothesis, what you're saying, can be in a second step uh, be tested in a more traditional uh, setting, cheap uh, cohort or something. Okay. I think. Th thank you so much. Thank you. I think this very this study would be very informative because type one diabetes are actually trying to make the case about this issue of depression and poor access to insulin driving the complications and things. And such a large study, I think, can be very relevant to actually inform the disparity that you can have between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So well mm. done and congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's nice. I, I want to follow up in this comment. Uh, so just remember, Camille, that the, the depression is not the same as the diabetes distress. Yeah. And that the unit of analysis of this study are the tweets, not the individuals, right? Okay. So we cannot say anything about individuals. We can just uh, exactly that is that yeah. is all those informations is based on on tweets exactly. Very interesting story, Adrian, and thank you for uh, for for your uh, very nice presentation. Thank I have you. three uh, questions in relation to your discussion, and they are I think quite easy for you. Can you say <laughs> an example on how uh, 
this approach could be complementary to traditional epidemiology, just an example. The second one is what type of new risk factors can you identify with this type of studies? And what would you think are the main challenges if you want to go uh, worldwide broad with this type of studies? Um, okay, I, I, let me start with the last one. Uh, the, the main challenges worldwide, um, because it's a, a rather technical answer, um, because you use, uh, so this machine learning, natural language processing methods you're using. Um, I mean, machine learning, natural language processing methods develop quite rapidly at the moment. It's really exploding, but there is still a strong focus on the English language. So the, the main challenge here is really to extend to other languages. Um, so, I mean, for, for this, just I, I used, um, so this, this word, word, this algorithm I used to get vectors for each word. Uh, that was something that came up 2017. And uh, since 2019, uh, no one else is using it anymore. There's completely new things out there. And those new word embeddings, basically, uh, they all come from Google, Amazon, Facebook, because they have the computation power. I, as a small researcher, I could not do that myself. So in a way, I'm, I'm dependent on those big entities uh, to, to calculate the, those but still, they're, they're quite, at the moment, there are quite some, some initiatives working on multilingual uh, parts so that you can easier switch to languages. So basically, that is the, the biggest difficulty at the moment um, to get those, those word embeddings in, in different languages, also representative word embeddings. Um, then co concerning your... Um, your second question, I was, I think, was related to what uh, risk factors exactly you can, uh, yeah. Well, and that th that is uh, the question. I mean, I I have not the same diabetes background than you have, so probably it's you can easier speculate about that. But uh, all those psychological factors, I think that there is a huge po potential behind there. I mean, in what situations people are, are stressed about it, and typically a thing that is super interesting what we what we talked before is um you can observe trends so when there's something new coming out for instance let's say a new tool to manage type 1 diabetes you immediately have a feedback um, of how people how how, the, how they use it if they accept it if they don't accept it but um it's uh i don't know i i, I cannot tell you exactly for i i have a bit of lack of diabetes knowledge maybe to answer this question and just reminding me your first question. How this uh, uh, digital epidemiology can complement the traditional epi? epi. Uh, well, you, it's a different source of information, uh, qu quite strong. I mean, just the big fact that people share the information spontaneously. I mean, in the situation when you're, <clears throat> when you're stressed about something, then you just you tweet something. You don't uh, remember that moment when you're stressed or you're annoyed about something. You don't remember that for six months when you see your, your, your doctor and then you go, or maybe some people do, but I don't think the majority of people does it. So this, this character that you spontaneously, you really can share, you can react on everything that happens to your life. You can give an immediate feedback. I think that is the, the biggest uh, strength there. Thank you, Adrian. Fantastic work and huge, huge work with the data processing. Oh like, uh, yeah, that, it, it, it took quite some time. Yeah, it took quite some time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, congrats. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I would have two questions. Um, first of all, thank you very much. It was also for me very interesting. Um, and um, yeah, the first question refers to um, the representativeness. Um, uh, is there's something known about um, maybe differences between different social media platforms? For instance, Twitter is more used by high income people and Facebook more by lower income people. So just if you know there's some information about who actually tweets or does not tweet. And um, the second question refers to Daniel's point um, regarding the retweets. Um, you um deleted those retweets and would it also be possible or does it make sense maybe to 
use this information of the number of retreats to, to give it maybe the topic that is in the street to, to give it a weight or maybe use the number of likes a tweet gets so that maybe a tweet with which is retweeted very often maybe gets more weight because it's a topic which is um, a main concern of many people in the community. Yeah, um, concerning your, your first point, um, other social media such as Facebook or Instagram, um, I, I cannot say a lot to that. Um, the, the first point is um, most people focus on Twitter data because it's easy accessible. It's way more difficult to make studies about the Facebook data or Instagram data because it's private. You make to you need to do specific collaborations with them to get the data. So there's way less information. Um, but I mean, certainly that there is there's some information, but I, I cannot tell you. I, I, I don't know that in, in detail. Um, but um, I guess that, for instance, the overrepresentation of people with type one diabetes is similar, can similarly be observed in, in Facebook. Uh, uh, or Instagram, for instance, but that, um, yeah, it's just uh, a guess. And concerning your retweets, yeah, that is actually, that is good, a good point. That was a hypothesis from us at the beginning to exclude retweets because we only wanted to focus on unique tweets, but it would be, it can be very interesting to, to focus uh, on the number of tweets. So uh, certainly that is a, a super interesting point. There's, there's just one thing to, to consider um, and that are chatbots because uh, there are quite some chatbots online that tweet uh, over and over again uh, the same things, or sometimes they just uh, delete one word. So we filtered out chatbots at, as much as we can, but if you do those kind of studies, you need to be very careful that you, you limit the, the effect of, chatbot, of chatbots, which could add an, an additional uh, bias. But I mean, yeah. Maybe chatbots. You, you could uh, you could try to identify them specifically. Probably you, you could train them a machine learning algorithm. You take uh, of one user. You you check all his tweets and basically and you calculate the similarity to all of those tweets. And when you realize all tweets that a user is tweeting are almost the same, then you you exclude them. In this way, this would be something yeah you could do, for instance. Yeah, the the internet is a uh, is an interesting place. Uh, let's uh, let's just say that. Um, I think <laughs> yeah, we are we are coming up on time. We have about three minutes uh, left. Uh, so I think that was uh, it for the questions. Unless someone has like a really burning question, uh, I think uh, I think we just say thank you very much. And I think uh, yeah, look forward to see what happens. In, in the future, and you mentioned something also yeah. about teasing out this uh, causality, but I guess that's uh, another story for another day. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it gives me uh, a bit more time. <laughs> yeah, exactly, but uh, <laughs> we will look forward to to hear about that when that is ready. And uh, yes, so I'll just say thank you very much, and uh, yeah, nice to see you all again. And uh, I'll just uh, stop.